Hey everyone, Michelle here from Gardening TLC. Welcome to our vegetable and herb series. We are going to be gardening throughout the entire summer and hopefully helping you become a better gardener. We're going to grow vegetables, herbs, and some fruit. We're going to grow it, and yes, we're going to eat it too. If you're a first-time gardener, that is awesome because you're going to learn some wonderful things about gardening through this series because we are going to real-time garden every single Monday. Join us at 6 o'clock so you can learn how to grow and eat right alongside us. So get your garden groove on, guys, because here we go. We know that different people grow things different ways and that there's a thousand different ways to grow a tomato. I'm going to approach this series with the premise that I'm going to have people that are brand new gardeners and I'm going to have people that are old novices at it. And you know what? Even if you learn one little thing about what we're doing through this series, it's going to help you be a better gardener. We are going to real-time garden throughout the whole season. And just remember, we're going to base everything on average last frost date. What is the average last frost date? Well, basically, it's when in your area where you live, where the average last frost date happens. Here in Northern Illinois, it's May 8th. Where you live, it might be in April or it might be later in May. But we're going to base everything on that date. Now, it doesn't mean that you'll never get another frost. It means that over the last 10 years, on an average, you haven't had any heavy frosts after this date. So everything that I do will be based on my average last frost date. You can actually just type in average last frost date, put your zip code in a Google search, and something will come up telling you when that is in your area. The other side of the coin is you need to know when your first average frost happens in the fall so that we know the cutoff time for doing fall crops. That one also is an important date to know so you can find that out doing the exact same thing, average first frost date in the fall, your zip code, and then you can get that information too. I do think that lively exchanges between gardeners is a really important way to learn and grow. So you might have a better way to do it than I do, and we are going to encourage you to leave your comments below so that other people can benefit maybe from your growing experience. And if you're new, don't get discouraged if you do something wrong or something dies. It happens, even to the best gardener. So just know that as we approach this with the attitude of we're going to learn something, we're going to grow something, and we're going to have something to eat at the end that will be truly wonderful because we grew it. If you are a first time gardener, I'm actually going to recommend that you start small. Because what happens is we let our enthusiasm for gardening, even as experienced gardeners, I do this all the time, totally overcome my rational brain and I plant way more than I can eat, way more than I can manage. And that can make you give up because you get overwhelmed. So what I recommend that you do, if it's your very first time, is plant what you think you can eat Think small and plant what you like to eat already and get some experience under your belt and save those dreams of preserving gobs and gobs of food for next year or the year after once you get some experience under your belt. Because the enthusiasm of growing your own food is very contagious and you'll get the bug and then you're going to want to keep going. But if you overwhelm yourself to where you're doing so much so fast so early, you give up. Because when it's 100 degrees outside, you still have to water. When it's 100 degrees outside with 100% humidity, you still have to weed. When it's 100 degrees outside and you are thinking, I'm not going out there, the weeds will take over the garden faster than you can say your name. And then we have a tendency to quit. I've seen it time and time again because we have community gardens, which I'm going to take you over and show you in just a little bit. We have 21 raised beds, of which I don't garden in all of them, although I garden in more of them than I used to because we'd let people into the gardens and it's a community garden where they're supposed to garden, give us some of the food, and we take it down to the food pantry. Halfway through the season, they will have abandoned their beds and now it's my bed to totally weed, fix, take over. I'll go back to, if you're new, think small. Also, if you're a first time gardener, you have to think about the location of your bed. Don't put it so far away from where you actually are that you aren't gonna make the trek out there to garden and make it accessible to water. If you have to drag a hose halfway across or all the way across your entire lawn to water your vegetable beds because you put them in the very furthest corner of your house, guess what? You probably won't do it and you're gonna rely on the rain and that can be very inconsistent and not great for your vegetables. The other thing is you have to decide, are you gonna garden in the ground or are you gonna garden in raised beds? 
both have pros, both have cons. I mean, you can do both, and there's so many different ways out there. I'm not necessarily going to talk about that. I am going to garden in raised beds because that's what I have. I like raised beds, and that's what I garden in. The drainage is better. They heat up easier. They are manageable for me. Mine are three feet high, so I don't have to bend over and get on the ground. So for me, there's a lot of advantages to it, and so I like the raised beds. Now, you're going to see I don't have some fancy layout. Mine are just like in rows, and there's grass around them, so it's not like some fancy thing. Um, we just do what's practical and what works, and this is what works. We have had these beds out in the garden area for 10 years. Now, some of them are starting to buckle and wear, and we know that this will probably be the last season we get out of a few of them, and we're going to have to replace them and redo them or not, depending on what we decide to do. Because 21 beds, let's say all my gardeners left, that's a lot of beds for one person to garden in. And I'm not gardening for a family. I'm gardening for Glenn and I. And even though I probably give away... I don't know, probably 60 to 75% of what I grow, I still eat and preserve a lot of what I grow. When you pick the site for your garden, you're looking for a place that gets six plus hours of sun. Eight plus is better. Now, there are some vegetables that you can grow in the shade, and we'll talk about those when we actually get to that part of it. You want your rows to go north and south, not east and west. By situating your bed where the length of it is north and south, you'll create the least amount of shade in your garden bed that shades other plants. Now, if you have tall things, plant them on the north side, so that way they don't shade out the things on the south side next to it. If you're trying to create shade though, plant them the other way and create some shade. I like to use trellises and different things like that to create shade, and we'll talk about that too. I'm gonna use a couple different techniques when I garden. One is gonna be that I succession plant, and what that means is that I plant a little bit now, and then I plant a little bit later. And that way I always have a little bit of everything coming in all the time. Because if I plant six rows of lettuce, I can't possibly eat six rows of lettuce all at the same time. So I'll plant one row today, wait two weeks and plant another row, wait two weeks, plant another row. Then I always have a little bit of lettuce that I can manage and get through eating wise because God, six rows, I'd be, my whole refrigerator would just be full of lettuce and I'm not a rabbit. The other thing that we're going to do is we are going to do some vertical growing. So I will show you some TP styles, some trellis styles. We'll use some cattle panels, just some different things that you can do that are inexpensive. Some that are actually semi-free because you're going to gather materials from your own yard. And we'll show you how to vertical grow some different things in the garden. Now, whether you're gardening in the ground or you're using raised beds, one of the things that you want to do is amend your soil. Most people don't have perfect soil for gardening. And the very best thing you could ever do is add compost or an organic matter to your bed. So whether you're creating your own compost, you're chopping up your leaves and throwing on that at the end of the season, you need to add something that's going to give you that rich soil that you want to plant in. Compost, you know what, there's a lot of compost out there. There's mushroom compost, yard waste compost, then you've got the manure compost like, you know, cow manure, then there's chicken manure. There are so many different ones out there that you can choose from. I'm not going to advocate one over another. I've used them all. I, I like some better than others, but they all will do what you need it to do. So just find some kind of organic matter or compost, and you're going to work that into the soil. Now, I'm not talking about the no-till method when I'm gardening. Now, I don't necessarily do a lot of disturbing of the under dirt that's low in my raised garden bed. And basically what I did when I did mine is I filled mine up with dirt all the way to the top. And I can tell you, it was expensive. My beds are four feet wide and 12 feet long. I like that size bed because I can reach all over around the bed, but at three feet high, yeah, that was a lot of dirt. Now there's a lot of videos out there that talk about putting, you know, the logs and the sticks and the different yard waste as a layer that will break down over time. And I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. Just know that over time though, your beds are gonna settle, they're gonna go down, and every year you should retop your beds with new compost so that you recharge that soil. Everything that you're growing in that soil is using the nutrients that are in that soil and depleting what's in there, so make sure that you recharge it every year. The best time to do it is in the fall. And put the compost on the top of your bed after you've pulled everything out of it and just let it sit through the winter. If you're breaking soil on a garden for the very first time, you really do want to break up that hard pan with a tiller and then you want to get that to a depth of six to eight inches. Add your organic materials in and work that in. And you should have this nice fluffy soil when you're done. Now the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to work your soil when it's really super dry 
and you don't want to work it when it's sopping wet. So you want to find that happy medium in between when you're getting ready to cultivate your soil. And cultivating is basically breaking up the soil. You're doing that so that air can get down in there, your roots have room to grow, water will flow through, and nutrients can reach those roots to help your plant grow. Let's say you decide to get a garden bed like this. It's smaller, it's portable, it's easy to move around. You can put it on your back deck. You can actually grow a lot of food in one of these. And you decide that you want to use bag soil to fill it up. Now, what you're going to do is I would recommend buying a garden soil because garden soil is formulated to go into a raised bed. It's sterile, it's weed free, and I would do a combination of this with some compost and mix that into my bed to fill one of these smaller ones up. Now, if I was doing a larger one, like over here, one of these metal beds that's gonna take a lot more dirt to fill up, if you wanna fill it all the way with soil, that's fine. If you wanna do some filler at the bottom, that's fine. Now, if you're gonna order like topsoil from a company and they're gonna deliver it to you, remember that that topsoil is typically the native soil from around where you live. It's the top two inches of the soil that's culled off. They usually run it through a pulverizer, but it's gonna have weed seed in it. There's no government regulation on topsoil. It's just the top two inches of the soil. So here where I live, there's two companies that you can get it from and everybody gets the same dirt. If you want sterile, weed-free dirt, you're gonna have to buy bags. And I can tell you, that's gonna get expensive. So you might have to battle weeds the first couple years, but if you get them when they're little and you stay on top of it, it's not that big of a deal. Whatever one you decide to do, pick what works for you, pick the size that works for you. Remember, if you're new, start small. Don't get overwhelmed. If you have transplants that you wanna take outside and put in the garden, you do have to harden them off. And basically what you're doing is taking a plant that's been in this nice, warm, cozy environment, and you're getting them used to being outside in the cold, harsh weather. So every day, Take your seedlings outside, put them in a shady location for a couple hours, and then bring them back inside. This is going to get them used to being out in the environment that you're going to actually grow them in. You're going to do this anywhere from three to seven days, uh, depending on where you live, because if it's still a little bit cold outside, maybe it's going to take a little bit longer, shorter periods of time to get them to harden off. Now, none of them want to be just plopped down in the middle of harsh environments put them in a protected area. The other thing that you can do is if you have a cold frame, that's actually easier because you can put them in the cold frame, leave them out there. Now, I don't have a cold frame, so I bring mine in and out and harden them off. We do have some vegetables that I've been hardening off outside right here. And we are gonna take those out to the garden and get those in the ground. Okay, here we are out in the raised garden bed area. And as you can see, it's nothing fancy. We basically used untreated lumber and we made 21 beds. Uh, we didn't start with 21. We actually started with nine, and then every year we added three until we had 21 beds. And everybody gardens in these beds out here, and they're assigned a bed, and they kind of keep the same bed every single year. And this is where we're going to be vegetable gardening throughout the whole entire summer. So I am so excited to get things in the ground. So let's talk about what we need to do right now to get a bed ready. We're going to actually do this one right here first. So this bed right here is my bed. It's been my bed for a long time. I did top this off with compost last year, but if you are getting ready to garden and you didn't do that, it's not too late to do it. You really do need to wait a couple weeks after you mix the compost in before you plant, but you could certainly do this in the spring. I do it in the fall because I want the compost to have an opportunity to kind of work in the soil. Now what I will do is grab all of the supplies that I need. So I got a pair of gloves, I also have my little hoe here. This is a hand hoe. I like this one because it's got a cultivator on one side, a hoe on the other, and it's all one piece. So this is like one of my favorite garden tools to use for the raised beds. I also have my bucket of seeds here with all of the seeds that I want to plant today. I have fertilizer, and this is the Fertilome Garden uh, Special. It's an 11, 15, 11. And this is what I'm going to use to fertilize my first round in here. I also have a spray bottle in case I need to settle any seeds in. Now it did rain yesterday, so this bed has been pre-watered. And that's one of the things I do like to do is the day before I'm getting ready to plant a bed, I will come out and pre-water it. It's a little bit easier to work with. And some of your seeds will germinate a little bit faster if the ground is pre-wet. And I don't have to worry about seeds that are just barely on the surface floating away once I water it in. So I'm gonna be able to plant this bed without watering it with a garden hose. I'm just gonna use my mister to settle things in place. 
I also have my onion sets here. I have some shallots. I have some Dutch onion yellow and I have also some red. So I'll be planting my onions today as well. And we're going to do lettuce and we're going to do peas. I have some broccolini to put out, so some transplants. So we're just going to get this bed ready. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my cultivar and I'm going to go through and I'm just going to get any weeds that came up over the winter out. And I'm just going to loosen the soil a little bit so it's ready to go. The other thing I did was I did stick a soil thermometer into my bed. And see, that's the nice thing about a raised bed. They warm up faster than the ground does. This guy's at 50 degrees. And so that means I can put broccoli, I can put celery, onions, peas, all of my leafy vegetables. So I'm ready to go. I also have a really nice patch of thyme in here. And I am going to give this a little trim back and then I'll just dry the time that I pull off of here. And any winter dead that I had that doesn't look really good, I'll just prune that out of here. But for me, thyme is a perennial herb and I have this one nice big patch growing in here. And it's going into its third year. So it's a pretty good size patch and this was one thyme plant. So as you can see, you don't have to go crazy planting a lot of things to get what you need. For me, this one plant is more than enough. Another reason that compost is so great for your gardens is because dark soil absorbs more heat than light soil. And if you have great organic matter, guess what? Your soil stays warmer longer. And if you have impoverished soil, it's the best way to build up that tilth in your soil. You know, when you have cold soil, the roots slow down, they don't grow as fast, and if you have fertile dark soil, everything kicks off to a much faster start. We are four weeks from our average last frost date, so at that time, what you can do is really plant a lot of your leafy greens. So you can see here, I've got a lot of different loose lettuces. And if you're a beginner, these are some of the easiest ones to grow to have success with. So I'm gonna be trying a Renee's baby leaf lettuce. I have a five variety blend. I also have a red salad bowl and a green salad bowl. So these are all loose lettuces and they are what you call cut and come again. So you cut them after they come up and then they'll produce more lettuce for you. They are a cool season crop so they're going to grow usually until about the middle of June and then they really can't handle the heat of the summer and then you're done with them and you plant them again in the fall. Another really good crop that you can plant right now are peas and I do have a video I will link below all about peas. I have some seeds that I'm going to plant today and I also have some transplants that I started and we're going to put those in the ground too. All your root vegetables like carrots, radishes, uh, beets, turnips, all of those can be put in the ground now as well. So we are going to start some carrots and some beets and all that good stuff there. Another really good one that you can put in the ground are your Napa cabbages. So I have some little jades started that I started three weeks ago and I'm going to put them in the ground today. I did harden them off already. And I'm also going to start some herbs. So today I'm going to start some Italian parsley, some cilantro, some curly parsley, and then I also have spinach and Swiss chard. So a good variety of different things that we're going to put out in the garden today, out in the garden today. Okay, I have now determined which seeds I can plant that are cool seeds and vegetables that can go in the ground today because my soil is 50 degrees. I have also looked at the forecast and I have no really super hard frost coming and that would be when the temperature is 28 degrees or lower. I do have a couple nights that are like 34, 36 and these guys will all be totally fine in that kind of a temperature. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read my seed packets to find out how deep I need to plant each one of these. Now when I plant my lettuces and my root crops, I'm just gonna scatter the seeds in the row and then I'll thin them out later it just makes it so that if I'm using older seed packets, I have a better shot of filling the whole row and having a better germination rate versus seed packets from this year. So just because they're last year doesn't mean they're bad. It just means that they're older and they might not all germinate. I'm still going to use them. I'm just going to seed a little heavier. When I'm all done with everything, I'm going to put my labels in place and then I'm going to fertilize everything. I'll mist in where I need to mist in, but the ground is still wet from yesterday's rain. And then I'm going to move on to another bed. So like I said before, I am not going to plant the whole package of lettuce. I'm going to plant one row. And in two weeks, I'll get that package out again and plant another row. Now, one of the things that I like to do is called interplanting. I won't plant all my lettuce in one bed or all my broccoli in one bed. I will move that stuff around so the bugs don't find it as easy. 
I find that I have a lot less disease and bug pressure if I plant like that. So I might plant some of that broccoli rapini in this bed and then I might go four beds down and plant some more down there so that way it's kind of scattered throughout the beds and for me that seems to work really well. People make whole videos about planting lettuce. Well we're going to plant a whole bunch of stuff in one video because let's not make more out of it than it is. It is so easy to do and I think sometimes we want to make it more complicated and it's not. I'm going to take the back of my little hoe here and I'm going to make a, a furrow in my dirt and then I'm going to open up my seed packet and I'm going to scatter them in there, cover them up, put my tag in, use my little mister, and I'm done. That's it. Now, I do want to look on the back of the seed packet to see how deep to plant each item, but I'm basically just going to make one row of this and then I'm going to close it up, put it in my bucket, and move on to the next row. The biggest thing is label as you go so that you remember what you did. Okay, you can see that I got it all planted in. This is the first bed here and I filled the whole thing. These beds are four by eight. Now in the first row here, you can see where I watered them in and I kind of did that so you could see my stripes. But there you go. The first one is a baby leaf lettuce, which is a cut and come again lettuce. Then we have a mescaline, which is also a cut and come again. We have a rainbow Swiss chard and this thing will produce all summer long. And I love Swiss chard. There's so many things you can do with it. Then we did three short rows of radishes in front of the thyme that we have here. So I ended up doing a cherry bell, which is a pretty classic round radish. I did a lady slipper, which is kind of an elongated radish. And then I did a purple, a royal purple radish. So three different radishes. Then we slide down here and I did two more leaf lettuces. One is a green salad bowl and it only comes to here. And then I did the red salad bowl and it comes all the way down. Uh, the next planting that I did was gangbuster spinach. So I did one full row of that. I did a full row of cilantro. And then I did another lettuce called flashy trout back. I've never grown this one before, so it looked really cool. So I'm going to try it. Then we did a half a row of Italian parsley and the other half with a curly parsley. So the whole row is parsley. It's just two different kinds. Then this is some kale that I started. This is a Russian frilly kale. I started them upstairs and I hardened them off. And so I just put them in in little groupings here in the bed. And then I ended the bed with two carrots. And so I have the nanettes, the scarlet nanettes here, and then the atomic red right here. So that's everything that I have in this bed. Now this bed will eventually be other things as the cool season vegetables finish. And then I roll warm season vegetables into the bed. All right, here's the next bed that we're gonna plant. We're gonna get some onions in here. We're also gonna plant uh, beets, turnips, and then some of our little transplants. So these are our broccoli rapinis here. And so this doesn't produce a full head of broccoli. You grow this for the little shoots that it gets and the tender leaves. I've never grown it before, so I'm really excited to grow this. All right, I pretty much have everything planted. I planted this bed and I already kind of went over what was in that. That's kind of like all the leafy greens. Then I did this bed. Now I did put a trellis up and we are going to be growing peas at the trellis. So on one side we have sugar daddies and on the other side we have another cultivar called, what is it called? Queen of the night. All right, we have our onions here so I can show you these. I have a whole video on growing onions. I'll link that down below. You can check it out. But if you're a beginner, I think doing the sets is the very easiest way to go. Make sure when you plant them, the roots, can you see them on there? Those go to the bottom and the little pointy grow tip goes to the top. So think about how big around your onion gets and that's how far you should place them. So I have yellow onions here and I come down to another bed here and I have the red onions down here, four rows, and those are my onions. I did some little Brussels sprout starts right here. So there's my little Brussels sprouts. And then these are a little cabbage called Little Jade. And so it's a little Napa cabbage. So I did six of those in here with four Brussels sprouts. So I'll cover those onions up and then I'll fertilize the top of the bed. Down here I did the Detroit Supreme right here, two rows of beets. And I know it doesn't look like anything but just dirt, but I did plant two rows of those and they will all grow. And then I'll show you how to thin them out and all that other good stuff. 
We have some more of the little jade broccoli down, or broccoli cabbage down here. That's these, and I did eight of them right here. This is a little baby cabbage. They're just like a good snack cabbage. And then here's two rows of the rapini. And then here I did turnips. So I did two full rows of turnips. And the only place I didn't plant is right here. So that is open. And then I'm gonna cover those up and fertilize everything. All right, you guys, that's all I've got for today. This is just lesson one. So we've got some things started. We talked about the important things that you need to do before you start. Make sure you do those things. And I know that's not the fun part, but they are really super important if you wanna have long-term success. Make sure you tune in every Monday as we grow through the season. You can grow right along with us. You can just check it out, learn some things, I'll even teach you how to cook some of them. I'm Michelle. Thanks so much for watching, you guys. We'll see you next Monday. Bye, everybody.